I gave people all the stuff they really needed. Social security checks, utility bills, TV guide. I want a TV guidance counselor. Here it is, TV Guidance Counselor, our brand new theme song for 2022, written and performed by Josh Caterer, who you may know from the Smoking Popes. I am Ken Reed. I am your TV Guidance Counselor. I am the, again on hiatus, Boston stand-up comedian and podcaster who each and every week uh, discusses classic television choices of our collective past using back issues of TV Guide magazine as the doorway into our memories to discuss what we would have watched with people that I know, people that I find interesting, and uh, you enjoy enjoy hearing. Uh, this week, this is a great, great episode for me. Um, my guest is <clears throat> Rob Lind, who you may know from the band's Blood for Blood, Ramala, Sinners and Saints, a bunch of other stuff. He has been doing a, a web uh, video podcast on YouTube um, as the Nodcast, as White Trash Rob, his, uh, his stage name, not his Christian name is not White Trash Rob, uh, for a while now. And it's really funny. Rob's really smart and, uh, has a way with words that I enjoy very much. Uh, if you don't know, I was in punk bands in the nineties. I was in a band called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. Uh, Rob, of course, was in Blood for Blood. Um, I was good friends or am good friends with Rob's brother, Mark, who's in the Ducky Boys, uh, and, and various other incarnations of his bands over the years. So, um, known him for 20 plus years. And again, it's always great to talk to Rob. Um, and actually weirdly a friend of the show, uh, Lexi Alexander directed the Punisher war zone, which features a Ramallah song in the trailer, uh, which is, I guess now that's related. I'm, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Anyway, uh, got a chance to talk to Rob, uh, and had a really good time doing so. And I think you'll have a really good time hearing me do so. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Rob Lind. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. Live via satellite from an undisclosed location in Massachusetts, Rob Lind. How are you, sir? What's going on, Ken? Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on here. Truly, truly. Oh, I'm psyched to have you. It's been a long time since I've, I've talked to you, so it's always great to talk to you. And uh, this is always, I always say this show is a good excuse for me to meet my heroes and also talk to old friends I don't get to sit down and chat with for, with for hours. <laughs> well, it's just going it, to, it's funny you say that because what we, you know, we just talked for like an hour before we just popped the recorder on. Yeah. And it was exactly like the last time we were all on tour or just sitting in a McDonald's shooting the shit. Yeah. That's the only thing I miss a little bit about the COVID stuff. Cause when I, I always, uh, jokingly, but I'm kind of serious. I'm like, Oh, this is like the world came to me and this, I'm like built for this shit. <laughs> but so I just miss like, yeah, there's people who you, who you like and you just shoot the shit about whatever. Um, and it, and it doesn't naturally happen when you're all in your own house. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, that stopped naturally happening for me about 14 years ago when I had my last drink. Yeah. yeah. That, the that social was, lubricant was gone. <laughs> gone and i realized that 90 percent of the people i was hanging around with i needed to anesthetize myself to even tolerate the presence of you are not included in that list well, by the way thank you i can still remember so many of our conversations i guarantee they're going to come up too like oh yeah i don't remember all right do you remember that time you were talking about the dilemma in capital letters where you shave somebody's eyebrow one eyebrow off and you leave them with the capital letter the dilemma yes yeah leave the other eyebrow or go with only one yes yeah it's what are they gonna do that's they- it's a great existential question because <laughs> they're gonna- I still fucking belly laugh about that to this day <laughs> i forgot about that dilemma <laughs> Um, so I plied you here with an issue from, uh, this is February 20th to March 6th, 1987. Uh, yep. sadly it's a Nebraska issue. I, it was one of the Nebraska ones I have. I've never been to Nebraska. I'm not sure it exists, but for some reason I have a whole, a whole cache of Nebraska TV guides. So you, you didn't well, get this one. TV guides vary from state to state and shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're completely different regionally. So for one issue, there may be 40 different variations for regional stuff. 
Now my mind is doing the logistics on what a massive operation TV fucking guide must have been back in the day. Do they still do TV guide? They do. It's it's not quite the same now. It's it's kind of a fascinating history, and I'm surprised no one's really chronicled it. But you know how like WWF's a good example where Vince McMahon went and bought all those little regional wrestling. Oh yeah, and and folded them in under and like brewers did that too they went and bought all little local craft breweries so they could have the brewery and then just mothballed their product tv guy did the same thing so um in the 40s and in the 50s that's called pre-national because there was tv got out of philly and then there were unaffiliated tv magazines like tv listing tv week and then eventually that tv guide magazine bought all of those and put them under one umbrella so they Damn. they kept the regional offices because they would sell regional ads and like there's they, you know, they kept the, the infrastructure then. yes yeah but it was all out of philly so it's it's a really weird thing and then they split into three companies in the 2000s tv guide channel which was the one where it would scroll you know, what's oh, yeah. oh, shit. Yep. which became, I think it's called pop. Now that channel TV guide magazine, and then TV guide.com. So they're to three totally different com companies now. And TV guide magazine is more like a bad entertainment weekly. It's like just press. Oh, releases. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's uh, cause who needs it? Like you don't need TV listings in a magazine now. That's completely pointless. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, for a thousand different reasons. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. What an empire they must've had at one point. And now it like, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally, my mind is reeling at the thought of the, the, the fucking logistics for a company like that, putting out 40 different issues a week. You got to get that shit right. It varies. Like mm -hmm. there's a different editor like that. That's a lot of overhead. Oh too. yeah. Different ads. And it was the single largest print run of any magazine in history. It was the most printed magazine in the world for decades. Jesus, that makes sense. Actually, that makes sense. It, it It's a crazy thing that it, it's. It, it just became completely irrelevant. And uh, you'll appreciate this, actually. A lot of people wrote for TV Guide. And if people at home are playing TV Guide, bingo, I'm going to mention it. Uh, like um, uh, Harlan Ellison, um, Ray Holy Bradbury, shit. Eleanor Roosevelt wrote for TV Guide. Like all these amazing writers and like pretty smart, intelligent people wrote really good articles for TV Guide. <laughs> Interesting. Fucking Harlan Ellison. That's fucking wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, he wrote. He, one of my he wrote Star Trek and. Outer Limits. Oh, and, I know, I know. Um, um, in his Glass Teat books from the 70s, which is about television, he called it the Glass Teat, and he wrote all these articles and reviews of television. There's two volumes of it. Uh, Harlan Ellison's Glass Teat, that's just so good. It's just TV holy, criticism. Holy fuck, dude. I, that, I, that, that plot, all those different writers. Um, it's interesting, too. There's a, I, I, there's a Harlan uh, uh, anecdote where some writer who went on to have a claim, I think it might have been Orson Scott Card, of all fucking people. That makes sense. Uh, <laughs> was writing to him and saying, why aren't I breaking through? And he said, send me some of your stuff. He sent him his stuff. Harlan didn't get back to him. I'm, I'm probably butchering this story and it's probably somebody else. But when the guy was fine, like, what'd you think? What do I got to do to break through? And all Ellison said was write better. Yeah. That was it. Write better shit. I was like, Bro, boom. <laughs> He's not <laughs> wrong. I mean, and no. he also, I loved how he didn't back down from a fight like him suing James Cameron. Oh yeah. He was notoriously contentious, right? He always won. He never lost the case. So like James Cameron stole two Outer Limits episodes that Harlan Ellison wrote. One was called Demon with a Glass Hand and one was called Soldier. He took those two episodes, mashed them together, and that is the Terminator. Exactly. And so Ellison uh, saw this either the script or a first cut of the movie. He's like, what the fuck? This is my two Outer Limits in one thing. Sued him. One huge injunction. Let the movie come out. He's he's thanked in the credits, and he got a huge right. payout. But he he was like, "You're not gonna rip me off." Like he th that happened three or four times. That happened with Phil Spector and the beginning of Mean Streets. He had heard about it like two days before. Let the damn movie come out, and then hit them up. Yeah, and was like, "You need to pull this thing from the fucking theaters." I mean, it wasn't a major release at that point, or it may, it may have just been picked up. But he let it slide. That guy was notorious for punishing people who like attempted to screw with his stuff, but. Holland, I heard, was also just contentious in his life. Like he yeah. got into like feuds and squabbles. It sounded like he was basically like the Gore Vidal of like fucking sci-fi horror fantasy. I know he wasn't really quite as much horror, but um, <laughs> just like a, a fucking... <laughs> He was he was just a, a cantankerous kind of miserable old man, the best yeah. I can tell. And I know people who were friends with him, or as close as people could be with friends with him. And they were like, he was, you know, charming and smart and brilliant guy. You'd go out to dinner with him and you don't know if you'd have the greatest dinner of your life or you'd get yelled at and have a fight with him in the parking lot. You know, like yeah. you just didn't yeah. know. That, that, 
that's what I basically ha- had read about him in that. Um, he just loved conflict. Yeah. Like he was one of those people that he'd pick something, plant his feet and just charge at you. It's circling back to one other thing though. Cause you, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about the pandemic of fucking TV guides, swallowing up all of these other little yeah. local things. Well, Obviously, that the, the, the one of the references you used as sort of a model was um, the WWF, and uh, I often think because I know, like, uh, I'm I'm really fascinated by wrestling history. I don't watch wrestling. I haven't watched it since I was like a kid. I went through a second phase in my 20s where I was trying to bond with my little brother Patrick, so I would watch oh, yeah. during like the Steve Austin days, and I started watching it with him just to like sort of like bro down with him. And it turned into I'd be on the road. I got into it. And I'd be calling him. Like, oh, what happened? And Steve Austin ended up shooting Savio Vega. I mean, he had the rifle. What did he do? Is he dead? Uh, I'm like, what happened? Yeah, what happened? What did he do? I got like really into it. But I still follow the business. Do you know the band uh, The Gods Hate? Yes. Their singer is uh, a wrestler named Brody King. Yes. His real name's Steve. But um, I, I, he, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal band. I mean, I love that band. If I were to ever do music again, I would want to play with them with my bands. It's looking unlikely, but he's a wrestler, pro wrestler, and he's gone really far. He's like a step below like the WWE, and he doesn't even want to do that. He he he, he would rather work for like Ring of Honor or, or one of the other ones. But he was one of the very few guests I had on my own shit because I'm so fascinated by pro wrestling as a lifestyle and a business. Those guys, it's like rock and roll minus like in all like Hollywood, but minus like any actual sort of product. It's like, yeah, it's strange, but there's a lot of like back in the day when they were the territories, these guys were the local, the like the, the promoters and stuff. They were practically like the local gangsters. Oh yeah. It was, like, there were carnies. It was mafia. It was mafia adjacent. They're basically carnies. They're the yeah. same guys who ran comedy clubs and strip clubs. And it was yeah. that same kind of circuit, you know, the, the vaudeville uh, theaters and then the burlesque theaters. It was those same kind of hustler huckster guys that would run that stuff. And in the deep South, these guys would gladly put a bat to your head to protect their territory. Mm-hmm. So I always wonder, and I'm, I'm, how many bodies do you think Vince McMahon Jr. has on him? Oh, oh, a lot. Like that I'm guy, gonna... I don't, I don't have hard evidence of this, but there's no way he wasn't mob connected. There, it's not, it's not a coincidence that he's based out of Connecticut originally. And Connecticut was the nexus of the Rhode Island, Boston, and New York. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he managed to go to them. Uh, and again, I have no, no hard evidence for this, but you could go to them and go, guys, this thing will make shit tons of money. I'll run it for you. You know, you can all kind of invest and we'll just take over all these things. It's the classic, like nice store here. It's mine now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. And it, well, of he's, course. he's been so like ruthless and such a relentless empire builder. It, sure. I, all, like you said, they were all mob adjacent, but he, I believe in his case, whether he actually, you know, connected directly with any of the families, I believe he had it in him self to, if not personally commit murder. So I, oh yeah. Push a button. And those yeah. wrestlers, a lot of them were violent guys and they always needed money. I, I can't, I just cannot see him having gotten to where he was in the particular, in the particular industry that he was in, where people would protect their territories with violence that he hasn't at least been responsible for a couple of hits. Oh, I yeah. just, I, I would be stunned. If you look at, if you look at like, um, like Rod Sterling love boxing. And if you look at forties, fifties down on their luck stories, like every other one was about a boxer and oh, yeah. because the mafia owned that world. And so many of those guys after their, you know, they were either humiliated in the ring or they threw matches or they were betting and their gambling problems, you know, became leg breakers for those guys. And if you notice middle sixties, when boxing sort of Muhammad Ali, really that era sort of, it becomes more mainstream and totally legit. All of a yeah. sudden wrestling real popular. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm like, you think those those guys who ran those those uh, scams just went just away? No fucking way. Um, it's interesting too, Muhammad Ali that it, it came up in the, this context. He modeled himself as a character off of uh, Gorgeous George, and I didn't realize. I always knew who, like on site, oh, that's Gorgeous George. Like, how can you not? A fucking cultural phenomenon. A lot of it, like he was for the years that he was active. He only really wrestled for like four years at that level. Um, He was the highest, he died penniless, alcoholic, cirrhosis of the liver, very young, typical wrestling story. But he was making something like $2.5 million a year at his height, which adjusted for now would be like $100 million. It would be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly even more. I, and uh, I, you know, I was reading an article where somebody said that like 
Americana in the sense of like cheesy, campy, kitschy American ugliness was born with gorgeous George. That sounds like, right. <laughs> yeah, you can make a you, you can make an argument for it. I was like, that is a defensible position. This 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 nameless author who I can't remember. Well, he's a guy who also figured out TV in a lot of ways because wrestling. Oh, yeah. the, the two the first two televised sports were wrestling and bowling because they were the easiest to film. It's, I didn't know that about bowling. Oh yeah, bowling. You lock down the cameras. It's one guy. And bowling up until 1972 73 was actually the highest rated sporting event in the country. It got 10 times what basketball, baseball, football got on TV because people listen to baseball on the radio. They barely watch it on TV. Oh, yeah. Football and basketball, hockey. It was bowling. It was literally like 100 million people watching bowling. And these guys made tons of money because they had 25 years of TV that went, this is the sport because it was so easy to shoot. It wasn't. You didn't have to follow a ball. People weren't oh, yeah. moving all over. It was Stay like- Stationary camera. Yeah. Standard, you know, just steady cameras, four around, and you're good. Um, and so wrestling, when guys kind of figured out that talk to the camera, you know, their spiel and and yeah. play up your thing, be bigger than life, like it was perfect for TV. And the guys that figured out how that works, they they got huge. And it makes it, sense. It, it, Jesus, it's like, um, it's sort of like Brando. Uh, prior to that, you had Sir Lawrence Olivier because obviously on stage, and I, I have an anecdote that I think you'll get a kick out of. Obviously, it's got to be big dramatic gestures and stuff so you can be seen. Brando realized, nah, the thing's right fucking there. He used to literally tell people, um, where's my shot? Where does it begin and end? And then he would tape his lines mm -hmm. anywhere in eyesight around there. But he was the first guy to understand, no, this is close enough where they can see my face bubble like a cauldron. And it's funny, too, because uh, you'd obviously be uh, probably more than familiar with the history of like Benny Hill. He got really huge in the club scene in, in, um, in I, I think it was London. It may have been Scotland. I'm not it was exactly northern. Sure. It was the northern gentleman's club scene, which is what they they had in England uh, in the in the sort of 40s through the 60s. It was it was kind of like it was gentlemen's clubs. It, it was just like, yeah. And, and he was wildly popular. And then so he's up and coming and then he makes the leap to the bigger theaters that hold like four or five thousand people and he suddenly starts bombing and his career almost goes under it's because in he was all facial expressions he was all like you know the reacting and stuff like that and yeah, that's yeah. yeah he was very um a lot of mime and he dies for a long time becomes kind of a dead entity until he gets a damn camera on him now he's readable at small clubs you could see his face this stuff i love that kind of shit like the the, the, the you know the 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 actual reasons and, and, and uh, you know, why things work, why things don't work, how people exploit their, their mediums and stuff like that. I find that shit fucking fascinating, which is probably a good segue to this. Oh yeah, totally. Um, and, and it's weird. Like when I always think of stand up, whenever I've seen stand up in an arena and I actually think this about music for the most part in arenas too, it just it doesn't work. I don't care how good the person is. I've seen Eddie Izzard. I've seen Chris Rock, uh, you know, Dave Chappelle and people enjoy it, but they're enjoying seeing a famous person, even though they're this, you know, two inches tall, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not the same thing. And stand up to me is like eating at a restaurant. And if you're in an arena. It's like watching it on TV where it's almost like watching diners, drive-ins and dives. Like you're watching other people eat and you're like, that yeah. looks fun. That's cool. Like I'd try to try that, but it's not the same thing. And yeah. it's, it's some, some art is inherent to smaller venues. <laughs> it just, or it's, you have to go the other route and make it not about the art, but some giant spectacle, like, right. you know, like Iron Maiden with a giant right. Eddie. Europa like, or whatever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So let's dive yeah. in here. This is this is a pretty exciting issue. We got Valerie Bertinelli on the cover here. Um uh, yeah. who somehow has managed to remain America's sweetheart when she's not a bad person. I'm not saying that at all. But she was going toe to toe with Van Halen when she she would tour with them. And she uh, I I met this guy who won MTV at a contest called uh uh Lost Weekend with Van Halen in 1984. And you oh, got to go with them for 3 days in 84. And this dude That I, is the height of their power. Oh yeah. I had him on the show. He's this this dude from Philly. He works in a in a warehouse and he won when he was 17. And oh, he went fuck. And you know the uh the video for Panama? Oh yeah. That's the show, the shows he was at that weekend when they filmed that. So this he was wasn't with Van Halen at the height of their power. He was part of history. Yes. And he's like, yeah, Valerie was bartending and good. Like he has the craziest stories and she's right in the middle of them. And no one ever mentions it. Yeah, well, this is the thing. When you sent me the issue, um, I almost, I almost not sent it back, but said, can we pick something from a little bit earlier? Because I, I think of my prime time 
TV watching period from like probably like 82 to like 85. Cause that's when I'm like, you know, I don't know, like three years old to like seven or whatever, but turns out you picked an awesome issue. I found everything I wanted, but the minute I saw Valerie Bertinelli on the cover, I was like, we have to talk about this because I have seen her face is ubiquitous to me. She has been in my grill since I, I'm going to find the polite way. I, since I was born, I almost said crawled out of my mom's cervix, <laughs> but I didn't develop a cesarean section. I was born with that cord around my neck. Oh yeah. Uh, the thing like Sly Stallone, which is for the way I've lived my life since that's very, um, what's the word? Uh, Prophetic. I was yes. strangling myself in the womb. It's a perfect metaphor yeah. for <laughs> yeah, metaphor. There you go. Um, but I still have, other than that, sh- she had an incredibly acrimonious relationship with Eddie Van Halen. I still don't know anything that Valerie Bertinelli did at all. Like, I seriously cannot point to anything. Was she in a sitcom? She was. She seemed like the, like the Bar- Barrett- Meredith Baxter ever, or Burgess? No, uh, Burgess. Meredith Baxter Bernie. Um, yeah, she had her, the, like the Hallmark movie lady or something. No, she, she started on One Day at a Time. Which, which was oddly a massive sitcom that people kind of forget. The remake. No, I remember one day at a time. She was on that? Yeah, she was the daughter. It was her and Mackenzie Phillips. Jesus Christ. I was just talking about Mackenzie Phillips to my girl the other night, saying that she's one of the most tragic cases yeah. in Hollywood history. Absolutely. Her father, a fucker, for God's sakes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Her book is brutal. And she had a huge substance abuse problem and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. She never really got clean. No. Not really. Uh, she had a horrible life. And so they horrible. were, they became internationally massive stars, like the biggest teenage stars you could be. So that I, other girl next to Mackenzie Phillips was Valerie Bertinelli? Yep. That was I Valerie didn't even, Bertinelli. I didn't even watch that show. Wasn't Snyder on that show? Yes. He was the Snyder. candy man? Yep. Yeah. What it, the fuck? It was a Norman Lear show. It was about a divorced mom, which was kind of innovative. Um, they remade it for Netflix a couple of years ago, and it's about a Latina family, which actually is perfect. And the scripts work exact. Like it's that's who would be in that socioeconomic situation now. Yeah. So it, it's great. Um, but that's what she got famous for. And then she started making like a lot of made for TV movies. She's one of those people that would show up. If it's like tonight, the cavalcade of stars or like variety shows or Bob Hope thing, like she would pop up and that like she was ubiquitous, like almost like Brooke Shields or, you know, Angelian, uh, like yeah. that, that, that group of people. And this is for a TV movie she's in. So she's on the cover here. She's obviously a very beautiful woman, which didn't hurt. Um, but oh. she's, you know, she, she's had a cooking show for 20 years. She, she, does, oh yeah. She's still on food network with this cooking show. Um, so. So she's just kind of always there. So she's she's still active then. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She's on All right. TV cool. every day still. All right. Good for her. Good for her. Um, I like to see people live past their uh, sexual uh, period of sexual desirability. Um, but I, I now, Valerie, if you hear this, you're not going to know who the fuck I am, and I don't expect it to. But I apologize for telling everybody that would ever bring up your name. Who the fuck is that person? <laughs> I did know who you were. I saw. Fucking one day at a time, many times. It's just that I remembered Mackenzie Phillips. She, I had just, Valerie was just sort of the, the pretty one. Like, yeah. Mackenzie was the, the character. And- yeah, she was the one that it was, it was rare when we were growing up to see sort of tabloidy, exploitative stories about people on television, especially younger people. So, like, yeah. Dana Plato, we got a little, Mackenzie Phillips, uh, you know, Drew Barrymore, Tatum O'Neill. There was a few that you would you knew there was problems there, but everybody knew about them, even if you didn't read, like, People magazine, because there was so yeah. few of them. Every, you know, even as a kid, you'd be like, oh, something fucked up's going on with, with her. I know that. I don't know what it is. Yeah, she was known to be messed up, Mackenzie, for instance, even then, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Christy McNichol. That's another one that was like, Oh yeah. Fuck. Fuck. He just knew. I know her name. What, what was she in? The first thing she did was actually little darlings with Tatum O'Neill, which was a movie about this summer camp and these two girls having a bet who could lose their virginity the first. And it was a huge hit. And then Christy McNichol was in uh, a bunch of sitcoms. She was on empty nest for years. That show with, uh, she was the daughter on that. I know her fucking name. Um, very, like very well. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm actually taking a second to look. You'd recognize her. Oh, all right. I know who she is. Yep. Oh my God. Yeah. Holy shit. She was, unfortunately, I forgot a picture of her in 1982. So right away I was like, oh, yep. yep. That's her. Yeah. So it was, there was very few of those people that we just, that you just knew there was like an issue with them, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and Valerie Bertinelli, 
didn't have that for whatever reason. And no, she, she never did, right? Never. And she was partying with them, you know, with Van Halen. Literally, that's like, like if you're going to have, Eddie, right? yeah, if you're going to have a substance abuse problem or you're prone to that in any way, two days partying with Van Halen, you're off the deep end for life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so she yeah. just must be yeah. not wired at all for that. <laughs> Good for her. Good for her. That's all I can imagine. Because I mean, and this was around today, Jim. The stories this dude was telling me. This was when uh, Van Halen had the little people as security. Oh yeah, insecurity, right? Yes, insecurity. And, he used to make them. Oh, just insanity, absolute insanity. Uh, I thought that was brilliant. David Lee Roth used to uh, have little people as a security, but he'd make them wear insecurity shirts. Yes, and they or they had karate geese on. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Right. He's out of his mind. Um, yeah. So just, yeah, she's just an amazing character. And then when I was looking through here, actually, too, there's a thing about Muhammad Ali because they're talking about Tyson. And this is. Uh, I wrote that down. I, I mocked that down. This is when uh, Tyson really became Tyson. Well, this is the interesting thing. I was reading the piece on it and uh, I realized as I'm reading it, holy shit, this is still the tipping point before Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson in capital letters. That fight with James Bone Crusher Smith was still in doubt. People were like, this is his first real test. Can he make it? Will he face adversity? A lot is on the line. Three fights from this fight, there's nothing on the line. No. Everybody is watching an execution. They know Tyson is just going to murder, death kill, savage murder somebody on TV. It was not in doubt until Busta Douglas, which ruined Nintendo's entire franchise. I know. Then we had to have the friggin' super macho man. Um, but yeah, my favorite thing is in this little article. It has the two uh, boxers, but it says Mike Tyson, and then it says below right, as if people wouldn't recognize a photo yeah. of Mike Tyson yeah. now. Um, yeah, this is the thing. This is before. This is when he's on the come up to become. Because this would have been 1987, right? Yeah, 87. So it's about 88, 89 that he is invincible. Mm -hmm. At this point, I mean, granted. He did Tyson did feast on a lot of cans, but um, who? I mean, that's just boxing anyway. Like yeah. uh, that's, that's the way you bring a fighter up. But I'm I'm reading this and going, oh my god, this is before capital letters, Mike Tyson. Yeah, like, he's not a household name. Which no, is crazy. at this point, he's yeah, he's just a boxer. Like, and I didn't even catch that little subtlety because it is a it is an important nuance. Pictured lower right, like yes. they had to point out which one he is. Like <laughs> which guy's Tyson. <laughs> Yeah, that one. One of my favorite interviews. If there's a Mike Tyson interview, even old ones, I will watch them endlessly from any period in his life. Not that I found him as fascinating when he was younger. Only in hindsight of the later Mike Tyson do I find his younger interviews much more interesting. But his stuff that he's done over the past like five years, where he's reflecting on his life, I find him to be one of the most fascinating, compellingly human. He's obviously not very articulate, but he yeah. can be shockingly incisive even in if he doesn't club. know it yeah <laughs> even if he doesn't know it and um he's a giant weeping sore he's like a giant boy man and <laughs> I, it's a, 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 i'm not saying this in a condescending way there is no mike tyson interview that he's done since his comeback since you know he kind of re reinvented himself and did, did his time in prison and everything um where i don't get something genuine from it like, I find him fascinating. Yeah, he's like the opposite of Muhammad Ali in that it's, he can't do the big brash, like, persona character. It just yeah. doesn't exist, because for whatever reason. Um, this, do you remember he when- He was exactly what he was at any given moment. Customato yes. created a killer, and for those years he was winning, he was a savage murderer. Oh, and yeah. that was, that's, he, he identified, I am a destroyer of worlds. And then Cus dies before he could finish the job and teach him how to deal with it. Yeah. And he never moved on from there. He's like, a, he, he's sort of emotionally 12. It's, it's very similar to, you know, what the Colonel did to Elvis in a lot of ways where, yeah. you know, they, they kind of, they never hear no in their life from, you know, age 15 or whatever. Um, yeah. To one thing, <laughs> do you remember when Hurricane Peter uh, McNeely fought yeah. Tyson in his company? And that was a Boston guy. Yep. And Nearly. he, uh, my favorite thing ever, and I'll always tell this story is they had a big press conference and everybody knows McNeely was just there to get his ass kicked. Like he had okay. no chance, but he didn't know that. And not the brightest guy. And no. the, pre the press conference, he comes out and you could watch this footage online. He goes, yeah, yeah. Keep laughing. Any of you don't think that I could beat Tyson. You, you got a, you got a big dump in your pants. 
<laughs> it's like that doesn't even make sense. It's <laughs> some of fucking Mike Tyson's gaffes because he used to say some weird ass oh, shit yeah. from time to time. Uh, but like you got a big dump in your pants. Come on, I'll man. fuck you to you, you white bitch. I'll fuck you to you, love yeah. me. Oh, Tyson Jesus was Christ. like, I'm gonna, eat about McNeely, um, I'm gonna eat his children. Oh, dude, McNeely, like six months after getting beat, losing by savage murder to Tyson. Uh, it, I remember it hit the news, and I hate, I loathe Howie Carr. I think that guy is a that cunt. The worst. Yeah, that guy sucks. But he did a piece on. It was funny. I'll give him this because uh, McNeely uh, got arrested on Lansdowne Street for like punching the shit out of like three people. Yeah, and everyone was like, "Where's the the? Where was this guy when he was got his when he was curled up in a ball against Tyson?" But I do remember too, in the a couple of months after uh, Tyson annihilated him, they must have somehow resurrected him with like an axolotl tank from Dune or something like yeah. that. Because he was in a uh, Pizza Hut commercial where it was the stuffed crust. Yes. You got to turn the pizza around to eat it. And he knocks himself out turning the pizza around. He was making a joke at himself, which I was like, ah, that's cute. Yeah. I hope he got some money for that. Humiliating sure. himself for the second time. <laughs> you got a big deal. Like, oh, like, you got to turn it around. And he's like, oh. like this. And he knocked himself down. Like, it's cute. I don't know if he even got that joke. Um. <laughs> yeah. They just walked him through it. Just trust us. It'll work. It'll be fine. What's, I don't get the joke. Don't worry about it. Don't uh, worry about it. There's also an article in here about the miniseries America. America! Yes. America! I wrote it down. Bro, 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 bro. I wrote America miniseries, <laughs> and I wrote Ham Sandwich. The interesting thing about the article, which I'm sure you're going to get to, is that it basically like destroyed the miniseries industry for like a long time because they spent $40 million on it. I remember it being a huge thing. Well, they tried to make it a huge thing, like the band The Strokes, but nobody was having it. Uh, it was not popular, but I remember watching it, and I remember there was a scene where they're eating a fucking ham sandwich. The wife's eating a ham sandwich, and the husband comes in and goes, what's that? And she's like, I got some black market ham. And he comes over and goes, mm, 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 takes some bites. And I'm like, Dad, why what's do they have to deal? have black market yeah, I'm like, why do they have to have black? Why is there ham? He's like, well, and he started explaining to me like totalitarianism or his his interpretation of it at the time. And I remember being like, whoa, that sucks. They got to buy good stuff on like the black market. Now, like, tell me that movie wasn't like a dumb, more serious, unself-aware version of like Red Dawn. Yeah, it was. So first of all, it was 30 hours. They did yes. a mini series over 15 nights, which now... You know, you would throw it on Netflix and you go, it's a limited series, whatever. And people yeah. wouldn't care. But I think the longest one prior to that was like North and South, which was like six nights or eight nights, maybe. And which was actually good writing. It too. is good. Like Roots, it, like all these, sh these were oh, great. Yeah. V is amazing. V was only two oh, nights. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to look at another uh, fascist allegory, V did it yeah. better in two nights. But 15 nights was like insane. And they had this. V was only two nights. V was two nights. Yep. Four oh, hours. My. God. And they, they made a series later, right? Yes, V the Final Battle, which was another okay. two nights, and then they did a series. The series is not great. Um, the original, actually, I've I have photos of me with the baby from V. <laughs> Holy little... shit! <laughs> that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, it's that horrifying. Takes me back, man, I watched. I remember being like really unnerved by V. Yeah. Well, it, it was the, my favorite thing about V is Ken Johnson created that show, who created the Incredible Hulk TV series, and is a really smart with the one with um. Bill Bixby? Bill Bixby, yeah. He went and pitched oh. that to and made it into a show, which was the only comic book thing we had forever. And he had the brilliant idea to go, you know, we're not going to have the special effects. We'll make this the fugitive. Make the Hulk the fugitive. That's the show. And then they made it. So he's a brilliant guy. He's still with us. Um, so he wrote this uh, miniseries about a totalitarian fascist takeover of the United States. Straight. No aliens. He goes in and pitches it. And they're like, yeah, we don't like that. And in the room, he goes, oh, they're aliens. And they're like, greenlit. <laughs> right off the rip, they did that? Yeah. Because he was Jesus. like, I got to, what am I going to do to get them? And it ends up being so much better. Um, and and America's an interesting idea. There's some interesting stuff in there. So I uh, I went back when the Grimace got elected a few years ago. And I, I, I rewatched this. I rewatched all 15 episodes of it Holy and shit. some of it is really prescient and kind of terrifying so the the 
the brilliant stuff about it happens off screen. It's only explained. And that's the stuff I actually wish the show was about. But essentially, there's a bloodless coup where the the Russians uh, ignite an EMP over the US. So all technology is dead. <laughs> we had nothing. No computers, no phones, no cars, no nothing. Oh, that's a big one, yeah. And then they walk in and take over. That's, that's how it happens in the thing. Um, in, that is in, pretty prescient. Yeah, in America. And then they basically set up territories. New England is the only is its own country and is not part of Russian rule in it, which is great. <laughs> we're we're like true America. And then there's sort of different <laughs> quadrants that they have sort of puppet leaders and it's and it's it's too long and it's not great. But yeah, this article basically says that. Like they tried to do something and they they ruined it for everyone. <laughs> which too too ambitious. Yes, yeah. Like what were you thinking? How much did you pay Chris Christopherson? Um <laughs> But it, it's just, I love that sort of behind the scenes stuff, which TV guy did well then where it was behind the scenes, but it wasn't like weird, bitchy, like gossip. It was like kind of, it was like an industry paper, you know, they're like, well, this didn't work because of this money and this thing. And uh, that's why, and we're never going to get the miniseries again because of this. Well, I was going to say, one of the things I noticed about it was um, it was very much pulling back the curtain. It wasn't just like big industry, like hype or, or propaganda or yeah. anything like it's like this is going to destroy this industry. This is what went wrong with it. If it had been maybe like six episodes instead of 15, it could, if they had only spent this much, it could have been this because I seem to remember it wasn't entirely poorly acclaimed. And I'm, this is a very vague. No, memory it, did, now. it got good ratings. It's It's very well done. Yeah, it's people just, just didn't stay with it. No. It and the problem was that um the day after, which came out in eighty four. Oh yeah. Cultural event. Cultural event. Hugely like that was very well done. But literally it was something like everyone who had a TV watched that. Like you, oh yeah, it was to the point where, and people forget this. It it you had to talk about that in school after it happened. You had to talk about it in school, and it was so disturbing. Reagan had to go on TV the next night, unplanned, and comment about it. Yeah, he addressed the nation about this oh, made-for-TV movie. Yeah, we're getting into at, at that point. We're getting into like fucking War of the Worlds, fucking uh, 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 Orson Welles type shit. Yeah, like that was a cultural event. The next day, I remember I was in like fucking kindergarten or whatever preschool or something. Maybe kindergarten because preschool this would have escaped them. But we had to sit down and express our feelings on: Are we scared? Did it's you know? Are you worried that this is going to happen? And which uh, is the exact that, that was the point? <laughs> like that, and a lot of people say that was kind of a big turning point in the in the arms race. So I think well, that it was, it was when people became aware of of first nuclear winter, popularly, like uh, scientists knew about it, and, and anybody with like half a brain, but America, you know, you got to make a movie out of it, and nobody's going to know anything about it. All of a sudden, people are aware of fallout and and, and nuclear winter and so forth, and it also called more attention to the mad policy of Curtis LeMay, which was mutually assured destruction. That was basically it. Now, yeah. now this was like people were commonly talking about this. Yeah. Which was huge. And so America tried to build on that, but you kind of can't. Um, and side note, have you ever seen the UK version threads? No, oh, no, man. I hadn't even heard of it. So the UK, um, do you, are you a discharge fan at all? The band, oh yeah. 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 Uh, so you know, um, see nothing, hear nothing, say nothing. That record. Uh, there's the song. Dooms yes. There's the song Doomsday, and there's those weird clips of like guys talking about faces melting and like nuclear winter, and it's like sounds like a, a newsreel. It's kind of. A I don't remember the clip, but I'm I, I'm getting the vibe. Like that yeah. was from that movie. That's from Threads. So Threads basically is the UK making their version of the day after, and it's so fucking grim and disturbing like there's a scene where this woman is trying to prostitute herself for dead rats to eat oh my <laughs> it's God. like it's so like it makes the day after look like a hollywood musical and and it's yeah. it, it is brutal brutal and the uk also had a had an animated movie called when the wind blows that david bowie did the score for and it's this cute old couple. It looks like a kid's cartoon. It's uh, I think it's the guy who did the snowman. If you've ever seen that. I and didn't. I didn't. So the whole story is there's a, there's a nuclear war and this old couple, they're just outside of Birmingham. I think they are, are slowly dying of radiation poisoning, but don't know it. And because they went through world war two, they're sitting in their house, huddling together, waiting for the government to come save them. Cause that's what happened in world war two. And they just die that's the that's a fucking movie and it's animated it's like a children's movie 
What was the name of this movie? When the Wind Blows. Fucking brutal. Well, wait, what, what were you going to say about the, the title? What uh, is, is what it, Oh, because it's the it's the wind blowing up to to them to with the radiation, and that's what was oh. in the radiation poisoning, and 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 it's so it's beautifully done, and it's 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 actually very uh, poignant because this couple like that you know there's this old couple it's like the couple and up and they're but just watching it's not them, just annihilation it's disillusionment too it's, yes it's them getting sick getting radiation sickness and dying and you're just thinking they're going to be saved they're not they're basically waiting for the very people who condemned them to this yes that's that's very eloquent what year was this 85 so this is the, like the the station to station era of Bowie. This uh, is like real Bowie. Yeah, yeah, and it's amazing. I mean, a little bit after, a little bit it's after, a little bit. Right? It's commercially stuff, but he does some haunting songs on that. Like he, the title song is really creepy and great. And for some reason, people don't really ever talk about the music he did for that. But it kind of it's a companion piece. The threads, like those two things in the UK. Really, when I talk to people, my friends are people a little older I know who grew up in the UK in the 80s. They are so staunchly anti-nuclear, you know, terrified, way way more than we were from Threads. And it makes sense. <laughs> because of Threads. Because of Threads. Yeah. Holy shit. It's funny because when you first started talking about Threads, I, I for a second, misinterpreted that that was their version of America. The series. Oh, no. Yeah. How'd they get so grim? And I was like, oh, day after, day yeah. after. Yeah, that's what it was day after. Oh, there's also, there's this um, totally unrelated. There's this amazing uh, dystopian eco sort of horror movie from the UK from 1972 called No Blade of Grass. Have you ever seen that? No, no. So the premise is it's based on a book, but essentially there's a, um, it's, it's either a mold or some kind of thing that kills all the grass. That's it. All the grass dies. And as a result, the entire ecosphere breaks down and basically it's the apocalypse. And the name of it was No Blade of Grass? No Blade of Grass, yeah. And, and it's... The, and the premise is that some weird uh, ecological anomaly... Yeah, happens. it's like a mold or something. Something kills all the grass. And then... So it's not even like, like, point, like, like radioactivity and it's nope. just some... Just something happens. And, and from the 70s? Yeah, it's 72, I think. And you oh, see man. society break down because now there's no animals. There's no other things. There's no, and it, it's this breakdown of society from that one thing that seems kind of innocuous. And it's horrifying. <laughs> Dude, I got to check this out. You, you have a good mind for this sort of thing. I love that stuff. Like I was just that sort of, which is why the last couple of years have been absolutely horrifying to me because I'm like 30 years of dystopian science fiction. We didn't learn anything. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, Dietrich Bowenauer is, uh, if I'm probably pronouncing that improperly, uh, improperly, uh, uh, is rolling over in his grave. I'll send you uh, one of his quotes. You'll be like, oh yeah, that's that's the state of the world right now. Oh yeah, like Dawn of the Dead is a movie that I think about all the time in, in the current state of things. Uh, especially like in the beginning when they're at the station and that guy's like, you know, some people still have a sense of humor. And I'm like, of course, it's growing up watching that, that, that seemed odd because I'm like, no one would say that. But I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how it would be. The world is literally falling apart around you and there's still people trying to do TV. <laughs> <laughs> trying oh, to do man. it like it always was. I mean, Jesus, oh man, we could go down a dark rabbit hole with this. But, oh yeah. Uh, or even uh, like, you know, the scene where, um, where they go to the tenement building and the reason they're going to the tenement building is because all the people in there won't turn over the dead bodies. They're keeping them in the basement and the re it, because of old views or they, they were basically refused to believe what's going on. And as yeah. a result, they all die. And it's the same kind of thing now where I'm like, you gotta, you gotta adjust, man. You can't just ignore it. You can't just do your old ways. It's going to kill us all. If you don't do that, that, that will be, um, I, I, I mean, I can't even like Romero was a genius. Yeah. There's just really no other way around it. Do you, let, let me ask you this, Ken, this, and you would be the guy I would go to, to ask this question. Who do you think had a more profound impact on what became the dead rising trope archetype or whatever, Romero or Argento? Romero, hundred percent. Because, uh, it, there's a, do you like the band The The? Have you ever listened to them at all? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is, will seem like a weird analogy, but weird. amazing lyrics. But there's a there's a uh, in the album. Uh, One of the strangest bands I've ever heard, though. One of the strangest bands. Oh, very strange. Super strange. But he has this, uh, the, he has this song called Armageddon Days Are Here Again <clears throat> that is very prolific. But he, there's a line in it where he says, uh, they've forgotten the message and worship the creed. <laughs> And that's how I feel about Romero movies, where 
people took the superficial stuff and just jettisoned all the the stuff that made them good and the heavy freight basically yeah and like the 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 fact the fact that they were slow moving and 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 technically not really much of a threat was what made them scarier because the reason everyone got fucked over is because they didn't work together and they ignored the problem it could have been anything the fact that they're also people is what makes people go oh i don't want to you know it's my brother or whatever and it's not you know there's that element too but that was completely jettisoned by the sort of 21st century zombie stuff which was lean into the video gameness and the sort of wish fulfillment oh, yeah. of like, man, if society started over, I could own this mall and I could just mow people down, but they're not really people. So it'd be awesome. And it's like, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something, Ken, you just stumbled on something that I think is one of the most toxic, um, uh, insidious concept or what, what would you call something that's in like the collective subconscious well, I guess that would be it, an idea yeah. that's in the su- a collective subconscious, because right now it yeah. seems like everybody, whatever, whoever, wherever they are in the political spectrum, we all have this idea of impending doom, and we've had it for a long time. Um, whatever your reasons, you know, what, 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 it's what, in the, the air. Climate change, yeah. Uh, war, yeah, resor- lack of resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the idea that, and, and, it's, and, it, and it is, it, I don't know how prevalent it is outside of the U.S., but it's endemic here this idea that well i got my rifle and my can of beans fuck everybody else i'll survive this and then it'll be rosy and dreamy no fuck that even the idea of like you know i'll go to mars like bezos or whatever that yeah. elon musk or whoever one of those cunts um yeah the idea and it's not you know this the, the right wing version i got my cans and my gun and when it's over we'll do whatever we want wing version of we need to burn it all down yeah. like it's a narcissistic uh, no, it version, work. regardless of what sort of side it is and it's funny if you like the yeah. twilight zone is one of my favorite shows of all time and it's a show that i always say made us better people but that exact lesson exact lesson is in like four episodes of twilight zone like the monsters are moving in a maple street is the one where they're all oh, fighting about who God. can go into but that is the lesson that we haven't learned yet and that's 60 years ago you know um yeah I mean, there's literally people thinking that th- their little tribe will survive a break, a complete breakdown of infrastructure. We'll just weather it. We'll, or we'll wait for all the stuff we want and everybody else we want to be punished. And then we'll climb out of our basements to a new day. Now, nah, ain't happening. Yeah. You ain't fucking surviving. Oh, yeah. Not even. Never mind. Yeah. I mean, that's basically it. Like, it, it, and that's that's kind of like, you know, that's really embedded in, in the Romero stuff. Like, yeah. It's it. The, what people, the derivative Romero stuff is what people took from that because yes, and it's worst idea of it. Yes. Cause like even Dawn of the dead, the wish fulfillment of, we have this whole mall to ourselves. The comeuppance they get is that's why they're dead. They killed themselves by latching onto that mall and trying yeah. to fight for it and being like, well, this is ours. Now this is yeah. where we need to go. That's why they all got killed. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it, but that, People are just like, oh, I didn't didn't notice that part, you know. Uh, no, yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. I just like the idea of being the last guy around. I can do what I want. I can piss wherever I want. Yeah. Uh, nah, that's no, not no. how it goes. None of the people that think they're going to survive a breakdown of infrastructure, they're the least equipped to survive it. Well, what I mean, do you do after the two weeks when your cans run out? Right, exactly. And that's you know when I when I think about threads or even when the wind blows, like the 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 kind of overarching message from those. Uh, <laughs> from those things is the lucky people died right away. <laughs> yeah. That is like 100% what you take from that. Um, also side note, um, you remember Terry bones from discharge. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Uh, and he was, in, he was, uh, he was in ministry. ministry. Yeah. He, yeah. him and his brother, I think I told this story on the podcast before, but him and his brother owned this pub in new cross where I used to live in London, where I went to school and it was the new cross tavern, I think. And it was this bar that everyone was afraid to go into. And I think I fucked in there, bro. Probably. Yeah. It was like a little dark. Dingy. I think I him. And, and I love, Terry was always super nice to me. He's they're like pretty oh, normal. Good dude. Yeah. Good dudes. And, uh, for some reason we play with the business a lot, which was really weird. Um, but so this is 2001, I moved to London 
<clears throat> going to school, hanging out with these English kids, and they were like, oh, we never go to the New, New Cross Arms, I think it was called, uh, or New Cross Tavern. So I'm like, oh, let's go in there. And I go in there, and Terry's behind the bar. He's like, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, hey, man. And he's like, you know, he's a big, scary-looking dude. Oh, yeah. And so all my friends are like, how do you know some random, scary dude who owns a bar in London? I'm just like, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> I'm like, of all the people. <laughs> so, dude, I am... I am can contemplate, and he is, and he he looks like what British people were scared of when they thought of punk rock. Oh yeah, like Terry, that guy. I I'm debating whether to share a truly tasteless story about Terry Bones. It's fucking hilarious. Um, maybe we can check back in on that. We'll check back in back in on that. I, I will hear that. At yeah, some point. yeah. It's, um, it's, it's, yeah. All I remember is those guys when we played with the business. They would they would have mirrors with them, and they'd practice their moves backstage in the mirror with like sweatpants on. I, I remember um, not seeing that, but we, we, we uh, Blood for Blood played with the business like a ton of times. And it was crazy because they couldn't understand a word I was saying because when I would get drunk, my, my Charlestown accent would get worse. Yep. And I truly didn't think they were speaking English most of the time. No. Like, I could not understand them. I saw Mickey. So Mickey was a plumber, which is hilarious. Um, and he was the singer of the span, the business. That is awesome. And, um, I would see him yeah. on the train sometimes cause he lived in Lewisham, which was like the next city down from where I lived. And so again, I'd be on the train with my friends and I'd see Mickey and he'd have his plumber stuff and he'd be like, Oh, I do mate. And then they're like, why do you know some 40 year old plumber? On the and I'm like, don't worry about it. I don't know. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. It's like bizarre. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I never, I saw them I never saw them practice the stage moves uh but I did see them do like like calisthenics to get ready to go oh, on yeah. and yeah. all we would do like is just get drunker now they drank make no mistake oh, yeah. they drank they took their stage show serious we just didn't care <laughs> well I remember <laughs> and this is a total aside but we were you know, I was 16. You were probably 20, maybe at that time, sort of that era. And those guys seem really old and they were like 30. I know. No, I know. <laughs> Granted, they were a bit more weathered than, than well, some, but you know, oh, they were I remember hard that. 30. Like they were, yeah. Yes. Road hard, put away wet for certain. <laughs> they were a 1960s 30, which is like a 50 year old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I know exactly what you mean. Time has changed. Yes. Like 100%. people look different now as they get older. It's, it is just different. My grandmother at like 40 was my grandmother until she was 90. Oh yeah. It's just like, stop. You're a oh, hundred no years change. old. Yep. It's yes. Yeah. That's yeah. a whole, but yeah. All oh, the Terry bonds. Good dude. So where yeah. were we? So yeah, that was so Saturday night. Anything else jump out at you there? Uh, we did America. That was sort of during the intro stuff. There was one other thing in the intro. Uh, I read the article about, um, Casanova. Did you read that? Yes. Yeah. Richard Chamberlain. I didn't have any pictures of Chamberlain or anything, but doing Casanova, I didn't even know he did it. I wasn't even aware of this movie. It was, I, I, I guess it was like a made for TV movie. That yeah. was like his, he was like the man for that stuff, but it's always most of what I wrote down or like that jumped out at me when I was looking at the, the issue that you sent was anything that had a pro put in Sonova doesn't I don't know what this movie was but Richard Chamberlain does because I saw him in the Thornbirds which came out right around the same time 82, and I uh, think. yeah 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 like 82 83 and it, I also saw him in fucking Shogun he was awesome in Shogun that King, was actually a really well made TV movie King Solomon's Minds was that the movie he was in yeah <laughs> oh yes it was holy fuck and I can't believe I knew that too <laughs> but um when I saw him in the Thornbirds there's the scene where the little girl, and this fucked with me so hard. He's a priest. He basically, like, is this avuncular relationship with this little girl, and then he ends up banging her. Yeah. Like, years later. When she's like, of age, so it's really okay. <laughs> yeah, now it's okay. Like, it, oh, it's creepy so as gross. shit ever. But she's, she's scared. She's crying. And uh, he comes over being, you know, the, the incredibly noble, trust trustable guy that Richard Chamberlain essentially is. Good for him. Uh it says, what's going on? Whatever her name was. And she's like, I think I'm dying, blah, blah, blah. He says, why do you think you're dying? He says, oh, there's blood coming from between my legs. And he starts laughing gently, of course. He doesn't humiliate her, rightly so. But he says, uh, oh, no, that's, 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 you are now a woman. And I'm, the whole time it's creeping me out because I know he nails her. Yes. He's like, that's, 
that's the when you have a baby, a man and a woman, he goes through the whole sex talk. He's like, that's to nourish the baby, and you don't need it because you're not having a baby. So it goes through the whole birds and the bees thing, and the whole thing just skeeved me the fuck out. It should, but people were like, <laughs> that book. It was a book before, which was huge, like a big summer reading book, and women were like, the book, the oh, the love actually, story, the love story. <laughs> the, but it, you're like, it, was, no. it was a good book, but no, it's wrong. It's so gross. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Very, uh, who, who wrote Lolita? Was that Nabloff? I think it was Nabloff. I'm not going to look it up, but uh, it's that, a Russian that's guy. the type of thing. If I don't, yeah, if I don't know it off the top of my head, it fucking bugs me. But um, yeah, so the thorn that jumped out because I was like, oh, Chamberlain? Oh, yeah, I remember him freaking me out when I was a kid. Which I'm glad it freaked you out. Like, I feel like I would feel <laughs> worse if you were like, yeah, that's how it should go down. <laughs> Test of character. Yeah. Uh, Finally, okay, TV so- showing how it is. <laughs> <laughs> in the way the way it always should be. That's right. That's right. Um, so, are we on Saturday night? Uh yeah. Let's let's jump into Saturday. Okay. So I I wrote down three things, but at five check this out at five o'clock on a bunch of channels. It was night court. Now I know the answer to this question before I start it, but because it comes up later, I picked it for Thursday night. That was my main Thursday night choice. We can get to that then. But my question was, if it was on early, does that mean that even at that point, night court was already in syndication? Yep. Yeah, it, it it was on. So this was eighty seven. So uh, the new episodes would have been season four, uh, and it was mid season replacement. So it was only thirteen episodes first season. So they would have hit sixty five episodes, and this would have been the first year it would have been in syndication. Eighty seven. I cannot believe how readily you knew all of that. <laughs> Night that <court>. is fucking <laughs> incredible. Useful to know. That is the equivalent of you asking me like the stats of like. Uh, 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 a a troll or an ogre from the Dungeons and Dragons basic set. I'd rattle off like, oh, six hit dice, uh, <laughs> armor class two, uh, you know, at, need, need to, uh, regenerates one hit point per round unless you use acid or fire. Like, dude, that was amazing to me. Well, thank you. We uh-huh. all have our areas of expertise. Yeah, so it was been the first year. Okay, that so that, okay, that <laughs> could not have more comprehensively answered my question than if I had fucking Googled it. <laughs> uh, Nabokov, that was the guy oh, who yes. did Lolita, yep. Nabokov. Okay, oh, so yeah. the, the, the thing I picked, uh, I picked Golden Girls. I do have a lot of fun memories of Golden Girls, but obviously Betty White just passed away, so it's very prophetic. And then our uh, uh, timely anyway, synchronicity. Uh, and I picked as my real choice, because though I have a lot of fond memories of Golden Girls, and it often freaked me out because of the character Blanche, because the thought of fucking her terrified me, even as like a yeah. five year old. Horny old ladies are not fuck fun. a sheep. Yeah. Oh, it just really disturbed me because they would say like, really, the innuendo got thick. Oh this yeah. This is the time in sitcom when innuendo gets thick. Oh yeah. Uh, and we can get to that with night. But the one I picked was Hunter. Yeah, Fred Dreyer. He was an ex uh, football player. Uh, That's right. Dee Dee McCall. That show was always really brutal. It, it was. Aud- yes! oddly violent for TV at the time. There's a great Halloween episode called killer in a Halloween mask with a, a burn victim killer. Um, and Fred Dreyer is like, not, I remember him being just really gruff and, and just brutal that show. I've since yeah. gone back and rewatched it. And there's a lot more intentional comedy in it than I remember there being. Um, and it's, it's kind of entertaining, but it's still, it still has a, like a sleazy brutality, but not in a way like Spencer for hire did that felt like a real, that felt real. It didn't feel like a real street level crime kind of thing. It just felt weirdly brutal. Gratuitous. Yes, it did. I'm going to tell you my two memories of that. And they revolve around just what you fucking said. The episode I remember best was there was a a killer and it finally gets on Hunter's radar that, that this is what's happening. There's a, there's this, shadowy biker killer and i he was played by he's like six seven he was like huge he was played by like the guy who played ogre in revenge of the nerds but it wasn't him it wasn't him it was somebody that looked just like him he looked like mick foley the wrestler if he was like six and a half feet tall but i think you'd recognize him in fact i'm certain you would it's probably lyle alzada but he played the jesus christ it fucking might have been it was probably lyle alzada Unfucking believable. I bet that that I think that was fucking him. Jesus, dude, you I'm impressed. <laughs> oh, man. I'm glad somebody is. Thank you. <laughs> oh, dude, like that's uh, this is the kind of thing like I, I have like total recall for weird things like that, and you have even better with this. But um, uh, he was his thing was he was this famous feared hitman, 
And his thing was he would kill people, torture them if you wanted, but no matter what he did to them, he'd make it look like an accident. So the cops would get confused. And somehow the whole plot is Hunter slowly catching on. These aren't accidents. He didn't talk like that. He, but like you said, big gruff guy, kind of like the shape of like cop characters. Yes. He, he was a good actor. I liked him for what he did for, he for the role. He was yeah. perfect. He was, he, was cast cast well. he was he was good use of an ex-football player. <laughs> yes, he indeed was. Uh, had the rugged Edward James Almond, like orange peel turned inside out yeah. sort of face. He looked like he'd taken uh, some punches. Yes, yes. Maybe had some cauliflower ears. But uh, I remember thinking like, what a fucking grisly thing. Like this guy tortures people to death and makes it look like an accident. And that's what he does for a living. I remember being like fascinated by yeah. that. Like. How do you get into a job like that? And how did that and then, become uh, his thing? A, like, did he stumble on it? Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like, uh, just sort of fell into it? Like, yeah. you know, like the ladies man or something. But the other episode, uh, there was a, they were tracking a serial killer. He was a serial rapist and killer. And uh, if I remember, uh, Dee Dee McCall, right? She was the woman. Yep. Stephanie Kramer. She was like a, she was a, a TV anchor on the show, right? Like a reporter. No, no. She's, she's his partner. She's a cop. But she would go okay, undercover. Yeah, I remember what happened. Okay, I remember what happened now. At one point, she goes on the news to put out some information. And the killer himself is on the couch watching her. And she's pretty, of course. She's gorgeous. And you see him, like, lift his eyebrow at the sight of her. And what he, he, the killer was, like, he would stalk people, the women, before he killed them. He'd, like, sort of, like, play cat and mouse and shit. And I turned to my uncle and said, wait a second. Are you telling me that he's going to get fascinated with her? I mean, she's like a cop and like, that's dangerous. And like, he's going to get caught. And my uncle's exact words were, well, if you're going to be sick, why not be sick? <laughs> and I was like, okay, touche. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with this. I'm with this. All right. This guy's real sick. And yeah. your uncle was Lux interior of the cramps. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. Dude, that's, uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I do remember that show being really jagged and hard edged as far as like the gruesomeness of it. Went. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it was people wrote about that at the time that it was it kind of had that vibe. Um, also, want to mention on Saturday night, uh, Valerie Bertinelli's hosting Saturday Night Live that night, and the musical guest is Robert Cray, the blues artist. Um, Whoa! Oh yeah, yeah, weird, weird connection of people. Um, yeah. And then there's a made-for-TV movie starring George C. Scott and Donna Michi called Pals about these army buddies. <laughs> getting into like a crime. Th it sounds interesting in a, in a car crash, terrible kind of way. That sound. Yeah. I would call that um one of those things. If you watched it now, you wouldn't be sure if it was like a Saturday Night Live skit or something like that. Like, is yeah. this for real? Like uh, George C. Scott in like a oddball quirky buddy movie. Sorry. There was a point on this show when I would have guests on and I would just start the show with, what terrible thing did George C. Scott do to you? <laughs> and they would all have a story. <laughs> I, I'll tell you mine. Fucking Firestarter when he played John oh, Rainbird. Oh, God, he's terrifying. He scared the <laughs> fuck out of me because his whole, he's getting like really, like he's got like this almost sexual thing going with the he's girl. He's buddy when he's pretending to be the janitor. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, they, and the uh, Martin Sheen's character says, basically asks him, what are you doing here? Like, I know you're, he says, I want, her to become my friend or whatever. I can't, I want her to become my friend. And when she looks me in the eye, I smash her in the nose and break her nose bone into her brain. Yeah. And the last thing she sees in my eyes and I take her power to the other side. I was like, he's talking about a little fucking girl. Yeah. He's fucking terrifying. Like, terrifying. He fucking scared me in that movie. Which he's supposed to. And also I'm still disturbed by the lot six scene in that movie uh, where the guy's eyes, are, oh. uh, uh, the blood coming out of the guy's eyes. Yeah. Uh, um, but also I remember seeing hardcore as a, as a young kid, way too young, the George C. Scott movie, which I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but the premise of that movie What's is that? George C. Scott sees his daughter in a porno movie and then assumes she's been kidnapped, goes out to LA and goes undercover in like the sleazy seventies porn world to find out who like put his daughter in porn. And then it's, it's grim and brutal. It's a Paul Schrader movie. There's this one scene where George C. Scott has a fake casting to meet like these guys who are in these porno movies and he's got a must fake mustache on. He beats this guy to death with a phone and like the full like motel phone. He's just punching this guy in the head. But then the best thing and, and 
it's a spoiler for the end of the movie, but it, it's still good. He finds his daughter yeah. and he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm here to save you. And she's like, I want to do this. What are you talking about? <laughs> And the movie Whoa. poster, the movie poster is George C. Scott with his face, his hand, his, uh, his face in his hand, all black. It says hardcore. And then in quotes, it says, oh my God, that's my daughter. Oh man. <laughs> is- that guy's trying to ruin lives. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, George C. Scott. That is fucking, it, it's reminds me, it's just like the dark version of the fucking, um, Charles Bronson movie, Kinjite. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's very similar. It's of that. It's, what a f- that! We, it's of that aesthetic. That very seventies. We, we basically, yeah. yeah. But in in the case of the Kinjite, it's just all righteous revenge against the perverts. Yeah. We used to watch that movie. Me and my punk rock friends every weekend just for laughs. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that is me. like one of the funniest fucking movies ever. That's most Bronson movies, especially as the oh, Death Wish movies go on. Like, what is it? Part three, where he's killing all the punks <laughs> and Alex Winters. It's just ridiculous, yeah. like totally ridiculous. Um, but yeah, George C. Scott, he just, I mean, amazing actor, but guy had a lot of demons, big alcohol problem. Uh, he had a friend of mine fired from oh, a yeah. play when my friend was eight years old <laughs> because George C. Scott was forgetting really? all his lines because he's drunk, you know? And when little kids usually learn <laughs> lines, they learn everybody's line. So- <clears throat> they're rehearsing and uh George C. Scott's forgetting his line and my friend gives him his line. He's eight. And George C. Scott grabs him and goes, You never give another actor his lines and starts shaking him and has him fired. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Yeah. I, I I knew he um he had like a turbulent history in Hollywood. I, I know him predominantly uh, from Patton because that yeah. was one of my father and my, and my grandfather's favorite movies. It was a good movie. It's all, uh, everyone's father and grandfather's favorite movie. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For that sure. and Zulu. <laughs> it's Patton and Zulu. <laughs> oh shit! No shit. That's right. Um, like like I mean, my like, Jesus, my grandfather. The one uh, my grandfather was actually in World War II. He was at uh, the invasion of North Africa, invasion of Sicily, and then at Omaha Beach. He hit first wave. He loved every war movie. Of course, like. He just watched them all. I was like, didn't you get enough of this shit? I mean, you drink enough as though. And yeah. yeah that's he's he's rewriting topic, right? yeah. what he experienced in a better way by watching those movies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this looks good. Yeah. I like this. That's what people are always like. Are you reliving your childhood with all this stuff? And I'm like, no, I'm rewriting it. <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. Hell yeah. Like, a, oh man, I just almost went somewhere dark. It's all right. We'll, uh, it we'll happens. Stay away from that. Uh, <laughs> where are we? Sunday, the Lord's Night. What'd you do? Okay. okay I originally wrote down Murder, She Wrote. Um, cause that's my grand, uh, grandmother's favorite show of all fucking time. I, and I remember sitting down and watching it with her at this time, like we would sit down and watch it. And so it was like a, like a, a fond childhood memory, but it got totally replaced. You could touch on murder. She wrote for sure. But because I forgot about this movie, or at least I didn't remember its name. And I saw it as a kid and it fired my imagination. Never cry wolf. Did you ever see it, Ken? I don't think I've ever seen it and I've heard of it, but I don't think I've ever seen it. It's it's a movie, but it's done like a documentary. It's about a guy, and I never saw him in anything again. It got like it got a bunch of awards that year. In fact, I think it competed uh, the year it came out. This is probably a couple of years later. This is probably like two, three years after it came out. It was a, a movie night, that, but it was about a guy that goes. He's like a scientist that goes up to the north, somewhere up in remote in Alaska, completely by himself, utterly isolated, having to bring his own food, has to live there for like a year until they come pick him up to study wolves and um it's done dead humor uh deadpan like it's it's not there's there's some humorous scenes but um his he, his big thing is he comes up with a theory that they're living off mice because they thought the local people were uh, there was like theories that they were killing deer or some shit like that or and he's like no they can't, there's too many of them they can't live off that so he basically one of the grossest scenes in the movie is he spends like the rest of the movie, he lives off the mice in his cabin. He catches mice and eats them every day. And it's uh. fucking disgusting. Their tails are hanging out of his mouth and shit. But he ends up joining the pack. And it was done very seriously. It was actually a, a really good movie. Huh. Um, but he ends up joining the pack. He helps them hunt. He doesn't become like a wolf man. It's not like that. It, it's done very seriously. He doesn't become like an honorary member. What happens is he starts flushing game towards them he starts running with them so they were cutting around and flushing yes they bring the game down and at one point he comes up and they let him eat from the thing and that's like kind of the big moment that's the apotheosis or zenith of the movie or whatever i was just curious if you ever saw it because it's 
fired my imagination as a kid. Yeah. But I never remembered its name. And the actor is utterly unknown. He's this, just this little nerdy guy with glasses. I never saw him in anything again. If I did, it was like bit parts. I know if it was it a fucking cool movie. I've yeah. You, I think you would dig it. Like, I'll have to yeah. Check it out. I'll I think you dig it. it was, and it was really popular at the time. Um, it, it, like I said, it, it was a candidate for like maybe some Oscars or something like that. Yeah. Maybe or golden globe that totally uh, i was just curious if you had seen yeah that totally missed my radar for some reason um but now i've had added that to the list um this night also is uh valerie bertinelli's in a made for tv movie called i'll take manhattan based off the judith krantz book so that's a huge deal this night and there's a failed pilot that they're airing as a movie which happened a lot and it's telly savalas leads the dirty dozen deadly missions i saw that yes this was an attempt to make a new dirty dozen tv series so it's telly savalas ernest borgnine tex cobb vince van patten james van patten vince edwards and bose vinson from walking tall i've never seen this but i imagine it's got to be awful as I was scrolling through, I saw the ad and all I saw was Dirty Dozen, but Telly Savalas's face, I was like, what an abortion. But it has Tex Cobb in it? No shit. Yeah, Tex Cobb and Bo Svensson, who was in a lot of cool stuff, and two Van Pattens. I, I just watched a documentary on Tex Cobb a couple of nights ago. I knew who he was. I just didn't know anything about him. What an interesting fucking guy that was. He was oh, like yeah. the original leader, like as a boxer. He was just like tough. That was his thing. Yeah, I've had a, a bunch of stunt guys on the show who like started in the fifties through the eighties. Like I had this guy on who uh remember the movie Against All Odds <laughs> with the Phil Collins song? Oh yeah. Uh but there's a yeah. scene where this guy falls like it's a real high fall, like basically off a cliff <laughs> down a waterfall. And I the guy Is that had, him? that's him. And he's like, but it, every single thing in those movies, basically the way they do the stunt is, well, yeah, what you do is you uh, you just jump off the cliff. <laughs> Like, well, yeah, but what's the stunt? Like, no, you just do it. Like, they, that's how they did things. Then it was like every stunt was like, yeah, well, what you do for, to make that car roll is you get the car and you just roll it, roll it. <laughs> it's like they're all they've, they've had every bone broken. Like they're just nuts. Like it's just guys that you do not have people like that anymore. Oh yeah, it's funny. Um, dude, I was watching um this really. Sp- Small fucking podcast for a long time. Spawn Ranch Worker was oh, yeah. the name of his podcast. He's basically like Leslie Van Houten's nephew or grandson or something, a grandnephew or something like that. So he's super into Manson family history. And he sort of um, assigned himself to be to keep up Spawn Ranch as a historical site because it's not a historical site. Right. But he basically so he calls himself the Spawn Ranch Worker. And he basically just performs like not renovation, but, you know, keeps the place clean, tries to fight soil erosion, shit like that. He's got his own crazy theory on of Manson, like like how he didn't do it or something of weird. Course. But he's, he's he was fascinating. I found myself fascinating. I was like and nobody watched this. But like his, when I started, my videos were like already getting more views and I get like hardly anything like. But I found him interesting. But he, either way, he had a kid as an interview. He was a kid that was on Spawn Ranch during that time period, uh, right up to the Manson murders, like like a year before that, like a year before he was there for like a year or two years. He lived up the road. He got a little dirt bike and somebody told him all oh, this like stunt men there and he wanted to be a stunt man. So he started hanging around with Shorty, the, the guy that obviously the, the Manson family killed and uh, the other fucking uh, stunt men there. And he had a couple of anecdotes about Charlie. And uh, he said that Tex Watson was like the nicest guy on earth that he used to take him and his friends out for ice cream. And he'd bring all the girls and they'd all get ice cream in the back of a pickup truck. And uh, he said that Manson, he said his one real anecdote with him was he first met him and uh, walked up to him. And Manson said something like, he didn't even say, what are you doing here? He said, hi, I, I want to learn to be a stunt man to Manson. And Manson, all he said to him was, well, first you have to be a stunt man. <laughs> I guess he was trying to be like Charlie D or yeah, some shit yeah. like he was that. Being Jim Morrison. And he, yeah, exactly, exactly. And even the even the dude as a kid was like, that didn't mean anything. And as an adult, he was like kind of mocking it. But his big point was this. Um, and it, it, it's relevant to like stuntmen being some of the toughest guys alive. He was saying, Charlie didn't run that fucking ranch. He's like, you don't understand. He's like, those stuntmen are cowboys in their free time. He's like, they were there as cowboys and they were stuntmen. He's like, they, on a daily basis, 
solved their differences by drilling each other in the face repeatedly until they got tired. Mm -hmm. He's like, Charlie was like five, two, and he was a bitch. He's like, and these, he went, whenever Charlie would try to throw his weight around. And in fact, the kid said, I watched shorty slap him onto the ground, pimp slap him until he went down and curled up over some Charlie with Manson was trying to push him around, push shorty around. He's like, you didn't push shorty around. Mm -hmm. Like the dude was a fucking animal. And I just remember finding that story interesting. He's like, nobody told these guys what to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Mid-century Hollywood stuntmen guys, they were nuts. Like, the, And they were the toughest guys. Like they, And they just do shit. Like, they they would have fun. Like, they'd be like, hey, you just, just jump through windows. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, they really know. were Brad, Pitt, Brad Pitt's character from Once Upon a Time in America. They really were that guy. Yeah. Oh, totally. And it was interesting, too, because I had this other guy uh, on um, named James Liu, who um, is a martial artist, and he he's a stunt coordinator. He did all the fight scenes for all the Marvel stuff, like Punisher and Luke Cage, but he also did, like, Big oh, Trouble in yeah. Little China and all this stuff. And <clears throat> the shift from stuntmen to martial artists, which is when we had a big influx of Hong Kong uh, action people in the mid eighties here, um, which changed how stunts are done completely. Uh, but it was interesting cause I had them, I had them on the same show and hearing those guys talk about stuff was, was fascinating to me. Um, and also James, like I, I'm a huge martial arts nerd and especially Kung Fu, which all the styles are, are very unique to like regions and all this stuff. Oh yeah. And, when stunt coordinators or martial arts coordinators do uh, fight choreography, they decide what style martial arts each character has because it, it has to do with their character. And so I was talking to James about Luke Cage and he's like, you know, and I said, Luke Cage has a really interesting fighting style. And he's like, oh, no one's noticed this. He goes, I called it slap foo. <laughs> Cause he goes, I had to think this guy can't be hurt. He's invincible and he's really strong. So he's not going to be an eloquent martial artist. He's going to basically just slap people. Like it's, it's, it's really blunt, you know? Um, but like, I'm such a nerd for that stuff. Like there's a, um, there's a Jet Li movie called the one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've seen it. So in that movie, um, and he was, he was not the main guy. That was a John Claude Van Damme movie and Van Damme got fired and they put Jet Li in, but, um, they, they filled him in. They let him fill up the, the movie. Yeah. They were like, that was have, originally Van Damme? it was Van Damme. And then they, they put Jet Li in, um, as the main guy, which was his first. So much better with Jet Li. Oh, so, it's much, so much better. But you know how there's all those alternate reality versions of him? Yes. Each one of them has a different martial arts style. <laughs> And Interesting. Jet, I wouldn't even have noticed that. Yeah, Jet Li, because he choreographed that himself. He he bases it around each guy, and then also, which is such a nerdy thing, when those guys get bested, and then he absorbs them, he has their moves. So he incorporates it. So like the the character that he is at the end of the movie has this totally different style. That's like an amalgam of all the others. It's such a nerdy thing, but I love that stuff. I wouldn't have caught that. Well, because you're a normal person, and there's no reason for you to catch that. <laughs> I, it's 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 funny. Um, I was a huge martial arts nerd when I was a kid. Um, I, I took like some weird, supposedly Korean style called Chung Mu Chung Mu Do Chung Mu Do, and it turned it's into Chung Mu Do halfway through my time there. Yeah, and it, it, I, I remember I was like, "Wait, so we're Chung Mu Do now?" I thought we were Quan because originally it was Quan. That was a copyright thing or whatever. But um, the minute I saw. So I'm like a, a, one of the few sports, perhaps the only sport other than a little bit of boxing that I like I'm really into, not into, but followed, followed. I'll put it that way, followed, uh, was MMA simply because I saw the first UFC within days of it happening. My old singer brought a VHS tape over to my house and was like, you got to see this. There's this little Brazilian guy who kicks the shit out of everybody. I'm like, he beats them up. He's like, no, he like strangles Waits them. out. Yeah. I'm like, How's he do? He's like, oh, he just climbs on top of them and does they just start screaming and they start tapping. I was like, Oh, weird. So I followed it ever since then. We used to watch them live. Uh, but that's when I kind of lost interest. I was like, wait, so you can't like throw fireballs and shit. I'm yeah. like, fuck. <laughs> it's not like Street that's Fighter like 2. Train. Although, so yeah, I've, yeah, exactly. I've become friends with Cynthia Rothrock and had her on the show and Cynthia who, you know, was in lady dragon and she was in all these martial arts movies in the nineties. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But she's, like the closest thing I've ever met to someone who has like superhero abilities. Like I was at her house and she's just talking about, I was talking about how I wanted to do wushu at some point again. And, um, she was like, Oh, you know, I could show you. And like, just watching her move. I'm like, Oh, you're a superhuman. <laughs> like, it's just weird. You would be older now, right? She's in her sixties. She looks amazing. <laughs> what, um, what was like, 
What was probably the biggest movie she was in? Um, probably the biggest movie she starred in is like China O'Brien. People would know, or um, know Lady Dragon was big. Um, those are probably Kung Fu, right? Kung Fu, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but also like you know Don, who Donnie Yen is? Is he the chubby guy? No, that's Chai. That's yeah. that's no, that's uh, that's um, uh, not Chai and Fat. It's um, uh, Sammo Hung. Sammo Hung who was in. Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah. Well, Jesus. Yeah, you know your shit. You I love shit. love martial arts guys, but Donnie Yen, who's in um, he's in Star Wars Rogue One. A lot of people would know him from. He's amazing martial artist. He's what li- character did he play? Uh, he's the blind guy. Oh, all right, yep, yep, okay. So he's literally one of the biggest movie stars in the entire world, everywhere except the U.S. Like massive movie star, and he's from Boston. He grew up in Chinatown. Really. <laughs> His mother is Master Bo Sim Mok, who still has a Kung Fu school in Chinatown. She's like 80 something years old and is the like the greatest living practitioner of martial arts. She studied with guys that taught Bruce Lee. Like she's unbelievable. And she taught Donnie Yen. Yeah, he grew up in Chinatown. And he, you know, up until Rogue One, really, you'd see him on the subway sometimes going to visit his mother. But meanwhile, he literally is like a Tom Cruise level star everywhere else in the world and needs like, you know, huge entourage of like protected, but like you just see him on the train. Jesus Christ. That's crazy too. How, um, I mean, think about, well, just think about how big a market China is. Oh yeah. I mean, it's one out of four people on earth. So if you're a star there or India, like that guy, um, uh, that big action star in India, like, uh, Mombi, I think his name is, he's like a one word guy, like Oprah. Yeah. Like, you know, like that, but, uh, you know what I found most interesting about that 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 uh, class or that generation of martial artists, like um, uh, not Jet Li, it was before that, uh, Jackie Chan, oh, yeah. uh, Samuel Hung, uh, they came from Chinese opera, mm-hmm. uh, which is that crazy dance shit. I find that shit so they're the last generation. They don't do that anymore because it's basically the training is so brutal. It's child it's like abuse. Illegal. Yeah. It's I mean, abuse. their families, their families oh, basically oh. sold them into that Chinese yeah. opera. They were called the seven little fortunes. Um, and Yoon Bu is also one of them. And Yoon Bu is a guy who he was in the seven little fortunes with Jackie Chan and um, with Samuel Hung. But Yoon Bu is, maybe the greatest martial artist I've ever seen, never came over to America, so no one knows who he is. His Asian martial arts movies, he does the craziest shit I've ever seen in my life, and he's doing it for real. Like, there's a scene in this movie called Above the Law that he's in where he jumps off, like, a third-story building, grabs a, um, like, a, a railing on a fence, goes through it, jumps up, and lands on it on his feet. Whoa. <laughs> and it's like, he's just does it. <laughs> it's, it, it it's legit it's like not but he it, no it's, it's a legit thing legit no wires nothing and talking to cynthia about that stuff because she was working for golden harvest at that time who was like the second biggest studio in hong kong they would literally just have you do stuff you were fighting they were hitting each other they're fighting she's like yeah and 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 she'll do i mean she's like an adrenaline junkie so she's like yeah they'd have you jump off a building land on the roof of a moving bus like you just fucking do it <laughs> I remember um, us being amazed as Westerners that Jackie Chan did all those stunts. That sounds yeah. like it's almost nothing compared to what they're doing. Yeah, he was. He would do more comedic stuff. So, and he got hurt a lot. He got hurt real bad. He almost oh, yeah. died many times. Yeah. But th- those other guys, yeah, they they were doing. Yoon Bu is just like. There's compilations on YouTube of his stuff. Like he's unbelievably fast, and uh, Jet Li's really good as well. It's been a long time, Ken, since I've met anybody that has stories that are as cool or even cooler than my own and just about the chinese opera did you ever see a movie from the 80s called farewell my concubine yes that's the movie that got me interested in reading about chinese opera and how brutal that sh- stuff was oh, yeah. for the kids it's it you just beat kids till they're good at a thing it was horrific horrific um yeah and jackie was, chan talks about it was, that. it was it was it was horrific yeah it really is. It's. It, I'm yeah. glad it's gone. I mean, but it was families desperate. I, I am too. I mean, I, it was families like we can't feed oh, this yeah, kid. Sure. He's gonna die. So go. Might as well take him and do whatever. Yeah. It's. Ugh. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, we're at like the the max for one episode, which I've discovered. So we have to do a part two. We'll we'll start on I think Tuesday. We'll do a part two. And also, I noticed here we're on the uh, RCA buy eight tapes for the price of one. So we'll have to start with that next time and go over like what tapes for a penny we're gonna get. 
fuck yeah and um the 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 two chords uh there was an ad for this is this modem cord which one is the phone cord which was the modem cord like that was progress at the time <laughs> yeah this will be good well, thank you for doing this it's been great talking to you I, I i haven't talked to you in a long time and i always love talking to you oh yeah this was a this is a blast ken thank you for having me There you go. That's Rob. Part one, part two, forthcoming at an undisclosed date, but uh, we we get it on the books. So you'll get a part two. Uh, Again, we talked for like an hour before we started recording and I was losing my voice. And so I think it's best to do uh, two parts here. Uh, And that's the feedback I've gotten from you guys. You'd rather I do two part episodes rather than rush or do like a three or four hour episode, which is is too much. So part two forthcoming with Rob Lind. Uh, Make sure you check out the Nodcast from White Trash Rob on YouTube. I'll put up links on all the TV Guidance Counselor social media, as well as in the description of this episode. Wherever you downloaded it or streamed it, it should be there as well. Uh, So check that out. If you enjoyed this chat, you will enjoy Rob's. uh, They're not Rob's observations. That's Rob Liefeld, but they kind of are. Uh, He should have maybe called at Rob Servations if, if Rob Liefeld hadn't uh, hadn't already taken that. Uh, they can fight it out. I'd watch that. Uh, there's your UFC. Anyway, uh, I'm here each and every week. We'll Brie here for... We'll Brie here? <laughs> well, I do often eat Brie, um, but not while I'm recording the show. Uh, we'll be here next week for a brand new edition. So I'll see you then for that brand new edition of TV Guidance Counselor. <laughs> Now my mind is doing the logistics on what a massive operation TV fucking guide must have been.